one of the key takeaways in Davos 2017 is the feeling of uncertainty, a world that looks completely different from what we've known it, a transition which would make for a very difficult geopolitical landscape. And who better to get that imminent thought insight than Professor Joseph Stiglitz of Columbia University, who's one of the most eminent uh, thought leaders here in Davos, as well as the rest of the world. Let me get to this point, Professor Stiglitz, the world as you know it, and the map that you envision for 2017. Well, you, you put it exactly right. This is a period of extreme uncertainty. Uh, we feel it in the United States, and uh, we certainly understand why the rest of the world feels that as well. Uh, the president-elect, about to be president, uh, has said a large number of things in his campaign uh, that, uh, shall we say, are strange. <laughs> and uh, his cabinet appointees, uh, on a number of occasions have said uh, they disagree strongly on key issues. Uh, that has led many people to say, oh well, once he gets in, he will behave differently. We don't know. I think uh, one sometimes should take seriously uh, what a person says is actual words. And uh, he has uh, articulated uh, a view that the United States uh, should be basically number one to go back to a world that no longer exists when America could dictate to the rest of the world and he has uh, argued for a new protectionism that is rolling back uh, economic history uh, to a period decades ago. Right. How does this protectionist rhetoric reflect on the rest of the world. So we had the Chinese leader Xi Jinping coming in here for the first time in history and giving out a very powerful statement where it seemed almost ironic that an authoritarian leader is now taking the mantle which is supposed to be filled uh, by the leader of the free world. But is the sense of irony very much something we'll have to live with? Uh, exactly. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that many Americans are concerned with is the way in which he is insensitive to the rule of law. Uh, he picks out particular firms and criticizes them. Uh, that is not the way that democratic leaders in the past behave. If you don't like a certain, uh, you think American firms are not investing enough at home, you change the tax laws, you change the, the economic uh, legislation, but you don't pick on companies, you don't bully companies. That's not a democratic way, it's an authoritarian way, it's a way associated with fascism, it's a way uh, that we don't think of as American. Uh, at the same time, over the last uh, uh, 65 years, we've tried to create a body of international law, a uh, body of international trade law, uh, trade agreements uh, that regulate how countries interact with each other. He has uh, basically announced that he's going to tear those up. Now, renegotiating is one thing. Uh, I think it is. Uh, reasonable to say that agreements made a quarter century or a half century ago need to be rethought, but not unilaterally. Uh, there is not a single country that can dictate to the rest of the world. We are in a multipolar world, and we need to discuss, nego you know, discuss, and 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 usually that process of arriving at a new trade agreement will take years. So uh, his framework, uh, which is the U.S. dictating, clearly will not work in the 21st century. Right. I'm going to ask you, Professor Stiglitz, to give some understanding on this duality of what we are witnessing in the financial markets. So one side, you hear Donald Trump and his extreme statements, but on the other hand, markets, financial markets rejoice uh, about this new economy, which is only going to get better with less, lesser taxes, uh, less regulation. Uh, and this feeling almost, like you were mentioning, there's a duality in his economic message. All his appointees are people who are actually for the trade agenda. 
Uh, that's right, and I think uh, markets are often uh, short-sighted. Uh, we know that uh, in the run-up to the 2008 crisis. I think this is another example of short-sightedness. Uh, what they are uh, doing is uh, 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 saying taxes are going to be down, we're going to be richer. <laughs> Prices are going to be higher. We're going to deregulate, get another uh, uh, global financial crisis, but that's down the road uh, several years. In the meanwhile, we'll have a party. Uh, I think that's such short-sighted behavior. Uh, they ought to recognize that uh, we struggled for eight years since the 2008 crisis to create a more stable financial system. We haven't gone all the way. But we've made progress, and to tear that up is to put the world economy back at risk. Right, I'm going to um, focus on globalization, and you've spoken about it, written extensively about it. What is your sense about this new brand of globalization which is coming? Is it dead? Is it truly dead? And we are looking at nationalism more, uh, maybe multilateral institutions existing but truly domestic policies spurring that multilateralism. I want to believe that Trump and some of the other uh, things, the growth of populism in other, co other countries, uh, is a little bit of a blip. Uh, I would like to believe that, but obviously we can't be sure. Uh, what I do feel is that these recent uh, elections, referendum, have called attention to what has not been working in globalization and more broadly what has not been working within our democracies. Uh, I've written about that very extensively, the growth of inequality, uh, the way we manage globalization led to more inequality, but globalization is only one part of what has contributed to more inequality. Uh, if you think of inequality, as I do, is the underlying problem, having tax cuts that benefit the very, very rich is not the solution. Uh, if you think that global instability has actually contributed to the weakening of uh, large fractions of our society, and we know what happened in the last recession, 2008, the rich did very well at the end, but millions of ordinary Americans lost their homes and jobs. Well, stripping away those regulations that are meant to protect us against another crisis is not the way to go. So to me, what I see is going on is a set of policies that will worsen the underlying problem. Whether our democracies will recognize that quickly enough is another question. What to your mind would be India's position in this new geopolitical order, this new world uh, map as it's been chalked out in 2017? I think that it will be very important for India to stand on the side of globalization. India has been a beneficiary in the same way that many other emerging markets have. But the United States has also been the beneficiary as a whole, even though a very large number, maybe a majority of our individual citizens, have been worse off. Uh, it therefore is very important for India to make it very clear to the United States that we aren't going back to this world where the U.S. can dictate terms. And there has to be solidarity among the emerging markets, among Europe and China and India and all the countries of the world, that we're not going back to the world of uh, the 19th century or the 20th century, we're in the 21st century, and that the United States will not dictate the terms of international agreements that uh, uh, we need uh, global cooperation and uh, the rest of the world will go ahead uh, even if the United States uh, is not willing to participate. Trump and Trump phenomena is a temporary 
uh, phenomena. One has to realize that if one tries to cooperate with Trump in some of his bad policies, you are at the same time alienating large fractions of Americans. Remember, Trump did not get the majority of votes. Yes. He lost the popular vote. And so most Americans feel very strongly that uh, Trump does not have the legitimacy that would have come from having a mandate, a popular mandate. So it would be a very big mistake to try to cultivate uh, short-run goodwill at the expense of alienating uh, the majority of Americans by supporting somebody who is uh, clearly doesn't share the values of large fractions of Americans. Right, and I, I see uh, there seems to be a counter a weight which has been set up by China and others and hopefully India and other countries will join uh, to provide so. yes, that counter argument. My, my question uh, and a final question to you is what is the degree of fear in Davos, whether it's, be, it's around Trump or whether it's around this fear that globalization is changing the world as we know it, to your mind, is 2017 hugely uncertain? Should we all be scared? Scared is not the right word, but clearly uncertain. Uh, and I think the response to that uncertainty should be resolve. That is to say, climate change is real. The rest of the country should say, we're going ahead with the Paris deal with or without the United States. And if the United States pollutes against the kind of agreement, we'll have to impose border taxes to change the incentives of American firms so that they don't engage in that kind of pollution. If the United States withdraws from the kind of global framework of of commerce, of the international rule of law, well, uh, we can go ahead. Uh, we are not in 1944 in the aftermath of World War II. We are in 2017. We have strong countries that were colonies back in 1944 that are now very strongly standing on their own feet. And uh, that kind of resolve is what we need uh, in 2017. I like that answer. It's not about fear, it's about resolve. Joseph Stiglitz, many thanks indeed. Thank you very much.